Okay, well, thank you very much, Chris. We're going to switch now to another civil engineering colleague. So, uh, Chris is, was, uh, is a professor or fellow here. We have a different type of fellow. We have all sorts of fellows in, in the engineering department. Um, Richard is one of these who's won an award for five years from the Research Council, EPSRC, to be able to concentrate on his research. And it's just, is it 15 months into it now? Uh, about that, yeah. About 15 months. But obviously, he's not just going to talk about the last 15 months, but he's also going to tell you about some of his research um, in designing and testing advanced tidal stream um, turb turbine arrays. Over to you, Richard. Thank you. Um, I will try and keep us diligent to time. Uh, so we have a very active um, uh, aspect of our work in civil engineering and renewable energy that spans both um, wind and tidal energy principally, fluid mechanics and geotechnics. I'm going to constrain myself to talking about tidal energy, I also work, work a little bit in, in wind energy as well, uh, but I lead much of the device design work for tidal energy. Um, so I've put some co-authors on the side here who have been uh, specifically involved in, this, in the work I'm going to be discussing and some acknowledgements at the end to others who also uh, helped out. Um, so over the last, I've been working in this area for about 12 years and I think over the last seven or eight years we've gone through trying to develop theory and then wondering whether our theory is right, doing simulation and now finally getting towards doing experiments. And I'm going to take you through a, a slight potted history of some of that, uh, culminating in these experiments which we completed I think about 10 weeks ago, uh, so it's sort of very, very fresh in our minds. So this is um, what we're worried about here, I'll give you some introductory information to start with. This is tidal stream energy as distinct from tidal range energy. Most people think of uh, tidal energy as all to do with things like the uh, Swansea Lagoon and the barrage, trying to develop a potential head difference between two reservoirs and taking energy out. We're not interested in that here. What we're interested in are things like this that really look like underwater wind turbines, and we can just think about them that way uh, rather simplistically for the moment. So it's extraction of hydrokinetic energy. So this, obviously, we recognise. This is a map of the UK. Uh, there's a contour here of the, the colours in there of the ma maximum spring flow speed. So the maximum, this is the maximum tidal spring flow speed. Peaks about five metres per second, somewhere up here uh, in what's called the Pentland Firth that connects the Atlantic to the North Sea. So the tidal wave squashes through the flow north of Scotland, south of the, uh, the Orkney Islands, etc. And you get a nice big high flow speed of five metres per second. Lots of other areas around Anglesey, for instance, up uh, along the uh, uh, seven as well, high flow speeds where it's worth actually looking at taking out the energy from because the energy goes around about with the cube of the flow speed. So we want to concentrate on high flow speed sites. This work, I mean, in the UK, the UK is much is really at the forefront of this. It's been going on for, say, probably about 20 years with the first deployments with the MCT turbine strength of lock, or the first big deployment rather, at strength of lock in Northern Ireland back in 2005. So that was two. Uh, 600 kilowatts, a total 1.2 megawatt turbines. Moving forwards, bigger turbines, as in wind energy, it gets bigger, bigger powers. And then a few years ago, 2016-17, the installation of the first uh, small array of turbines, four one and a half megawatt turbines. Up, and this is again up here in the Pentland Firth, uh, just north of Scotland. Um, one of the attractions of doing tidal energy as opposed to other forms of energy is its predictability. Um, we can predict the, the uh, uh, movements of the, uh, of the moon, etc., far into the future, so we can work out how much energy we're going to actually get from a, a particular installation. And that, and that de-risks some aspects. But there are plenty of challenges that we still have to overcome to make this as successful as other forms of renewable energy, uh, solar and wind, etc. So thinking about this uh, globally, the technically feasible resource up here, 100 to 500 terawatt hours per year, uh, that's technically feasible. There's been not that much work to actually ascertain what's the economically feasible resource uh, globally. A bit more work done in Europe. The sort of techno-economic analysis has uh, put it at about 50 terawatt hours per year available, of which is slightly over half is within the UK, and that's about 10, uh, 10 gigawatts, or something like about 7% of the UK's requirement. So it's not actually going. To, it's not going to solve the UK's energy problems, but it's, it's had potential to make uh, a significant contribution towards them. Current deployment levels are very, very low, uh, in around 10, 20 megawatts. It's really at the stage where offshore wind was 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, um, etc. Um, small arrays starting to be deployed. Uh, a few have been, um, are in the process of announcement at the moment. 
uh, small arrays coming in over the next few years, 5, 20 meg megawatt arrays. Some up here, these are actually no longer going to be installed, but they've been replaced by equivalently sized arrays, sort of half a dozen turbines in the 1 to 2 megawatt type category. Um, the first big farm will be um, in what's called May Gen, just off the coast of Scotland, 86 megawatts in the first phase, and then almost 400 megawatts in the next phase. But there are other farms around the world, uh, particularly uh, big places like North America, where there's a high tidal range. The principal problem at the moment is cost. Um, estimates, best estimates are around £150 per megawatt hour, and that was what was actually bid into one of the auctions, uh, the government auctions for what's called... Um, uh, cost for difference, um, and that was two years ago. For comparison, the wholesale price of energy is about £45 per megawatt hour. Uh, onshore wind coming in around there, offshore wind 60, 70 ish at the moment, uh, pounds per megawatt hour. Um, so there's a lot of work to do to reduce that, but that in itself has come down from something in the hundreds a few years ago. So, as well as cost reductions, which I'll say a bit towards the end of this talk about, uh, other challenges are really around operating in a harsh environment and making sure your turbines actually survive, um, etc. So I'll just, I'm going to say one slide on challenges, it's all the negative stuff, and then I'm going to move on to the opportunities and all the positive stuff that we're hopefully dealing with. So to give you an idea of uh, the environment, this is your average looking turbine. It's about 20 metres in diameter. It's drilled into the seafloor in something like about 40 metres of water depth. It is a horrible, horrible place to do anything. Uh, it's far worse than wind, the shear profile is horrific, the turbulence is horrific, and you put some waves over the top, um, and somehow some of them actually survive. Um, <laughs> those of you who have got backgrounds in, in offshore engineering will be thinking about extreme waves and design waves and that kind of thing. This is not really a design wave problem. This, the design of these things is largely driven by fatigue. It's the fatigue damage coming from all this nasty stuff that's continually loading and unloading and stressing the blades. And that's what we generally have to deal with. So there are lots of things you can try and do about This is just some of the things that we're doing here. Uh, trying to use hydroelastic blade deformation to try and uh, unload the blades in nasty conditions. Trying to use uh, what's called, indi I think a word's gone missing there, individual pitch control, where we allow the blades to rotate around as they, uh, as they go around the azimuth in order to try and unload the blades um, and reduce the unsteady loading. Um, other people are interested in uh, what's become an increasingly large problem is the OPEX associated with these devices. Traditionally, you think of renewable energy devices being very CAPEX heavy and very OPEX light. What's proved to be the case for a lot of these devices drilled into the seafloor is actually the OPEX costs are really rather substantial. And it's all to do with the cost of intervention. If you have to send an ROV 20 metres down in a slack weather window at, 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 at low uh, tidal flow speeds, it really limits how often you can get down to your device. And so the cost of actually intervention, intervention and maintenance is really very significant. So lots of people are now looking at sort of floating systems to try and reduce OPEX or either bespoke installation vessels to try and actually reduce uh, the, cost of, uh, the cost of installation itself. Away from that, what we're interested in is just increasing the performance of devices. So if you think about wind, wind turbines, we've all seen sort of families of wind turbines on top of um, hills and things. Um, we space them apart because we're really worried about interference between the turbines. You're worried about one turbine waking the turbine downstream because uh, the flow can come from any direction. It can come like this, it can come like that. So you want to uh, operate your turbines a distance apart in order to protect the downstream turbine, keep its performance high, uh, reduce the fatigue damage that it might see. In tidal flows, the flow pretty much goes one way, then it goes back the other way. Not necessarily 180 degree reversal, but it's one way and back the other way. And once you are happy with that, you don't have to worry about waking turbines. You can operate them in a side-by-side -side configuration, which is what we do. Um, and once, so it's going to be something like this in the end. Um, what we've also got in these tidal flows is a whole load of what we call blockage. It's, anyone who's on a wind tunnel experiment will be aware that you put a, a big model into a small wind tunnel and the forces are more than you expect. Uh, essentially, uh, the flow can't expand around the side of it and then it gets forced through the device and you get a greater pressure drop across the device. So what we want to try and do is use the configuration of the turbines to try and inc increase what we call the constructive interference or the mutual blocking between the turbines. And this is the kind of thing we're doing here. And this is some of our simulation work, simulating an array of turbines doing exactly this. This is a, a velocity contour map across it's eight uh, one megawatt turbines or something, and you've got a big acceleration of the flow around the outside of the array, and different weights there behind each of the individual turbines. In an ideal world, what you would like to do is actually occupy the entire cross-section of the channel with turbines. And lots of people have proposed 
uh, uh, start schemes, you get lots and lots of power out of it, uh, huge efficiencies. You just can't do it because channels look more like this. There are deep sections and shallow sections, you need shipping lanes, you've got other maritime uses, etc. So what we do is we try and develop what we call short fences of turbines that operate in close proximity to each other and support each other with uh, this constructive interference. So I was just thinking, um, as Chris gave his talk, that this actually started as well, really, with a fourth-year project, a couple of fourth-year projects we ran in 2010-2011, where we started to look at uh, some of the blockage effects you get with a simplified model of a turbine, which is an actuated disc. It's, it, it's the perfect turbine that just takes the energy out, and we don't worry about how we actually make the blades. And then after that, uh, a colleague now, uh, Takafumi Nishino, was working here as a, a postdoc with me, and started playing more formally with how you might position discs here representing turbines, and squash them up close together. Uh, and these are some of his simulations, and you take four, this is a three-dimensional simulation, this is the cut plane through it. You take four turbines, there's actually symmetry here, it's an array of eight turbines, and you bring them closer together. You squash them up, and that's a sort of a five-diameter type spacing, four-diameter tip-to-tip, sort of traditional wind turbine type spacing. You squash them up, and this thing here, which is really just the efficiency, it's a power coefficient, uh, increases from 69% to 74%. So that's great. Just by repositioning our turbines in a channel, we can get more power. And this is the plot of that. You come up one of these curves and you get to a power peak or a power peak up here. Actually, you can't push them too close together because you choke the flow. So you have to be careful not to do that. And as you can see from here, it also depends how long your fence of turbines is. Two, two turbines, four turbines, or eight turbines. The longer your fence, the closer they are together, the better. So that's really what you want to do. So being good theoreticians, uh, we decided we wanted to develop a theory um, around this. So we set about a two-scale uh, uh, theory model uh, that uh, Tak and I published back in 2012. And it's got a turbine scale and an array scale. And what you do is you say, well, actually, the turbines are operating here. And a whole long array of turbines sit here inside, inside a wider channel. And there's a scale separation between the three-dimensional flow coming off the back of the turbine and what's really a two-dimensional accelerating uh, sort of uh, bypass flow up here with a core flow going through the middle. It's a lovely fluid mechanics problem. Uh, you can just solve momentum, mass, and energy conservation at the different scales. Couple them together uh, using uh, uh, kinematic and dynamic couplings across uh, velocities and forces. And that leads you to a solution for what the performance is of any given array of turbines. Uh, in a very theoretical way. So this is actually the final result. I mean, that's skipping 100 steps, but this is, a, this is a, a map of the maximum power you can possibly get. And it's parameterized here against uh, two parameters, what we call global blockage and local blockage. And these are just geometric factors. Global blockage is the total frontal area of all my turbines divided by the cross-sectional area of the channel. And that should always be a small number. It's never going to be more than 5 or 10%. The, uh, the local blockage is the area of the turbine divided by the flow passage area. So actually something to do with how close my turbines get together. Okay? So those who are familiar with wind energy will recognise, sorry, these contours here are the, uh, are the power coefficient. Those familiar with wind energy will recognise this point down here. This is BETS limit. This is 59.3% energy extraction. And any global blockage somewhere in here and then some local blockage will give you more power. So that's what we're trying to do. Really, it's the local blockage that's important, not the global blockage, because you just can't achieve global blockage. So if we pick off the bottom axis on here, the bottom axis is by far the most important data, uh, which corresponds to something that looks like this. It's a little array of turbines, and this is in an otherwise infinitely wide channel. We're trying to do this in the middle of the open ocean, but it's conveniently 40 metres deep, or something like that. So we have our little array of turbines. Uh, that's, the, that's the wind limit. We squash them up. We increase our local blockage. We get to 40% dish local blockage, and we come up to a new maximum, which is 79.8% of the kinetic energy flux. So we can actually increase the theoretical limit of energy extraction by about 35%. So it's a very substantial increase in potential energy you can get. And really, the work we've been doing for the last five or six years has been about developing the turbines to then actually try and access that energy, which is where I want to get to uh, by the end of this. So we've done theory, we can do simulation, we can do experiment to prove various bits of this. I won't go into too much detail, this is going to get some attack of simulations. Uh, this is a, a half of an array of eight turbines, different curves here for power, different models actually, that's the original model, there's a modified model to do something to do with the finiteness of the array of turbines, but lots of points in here that line up uh, sensibly with the theoretical results. 
so we believe the computations. But nobody else really believes computations, so you have to go and do experiments. So this is our first experimental campaign. This is a PhD student, Susanna Cook, uh, who did an experiment up in the five metre wide flume in Manchester. A colleague up there, Tim Stallard, involved in this as well, and Byron Byrne uh, here in Oxford. Uh, and these are eight little actuated discs we use. They're all supported on stalks with strain gauges, so we can measure the forces on the turbines. By changing the number of discs and the spacing between them, we can change the global blockage. That's the number of turbines, and then the spacing gives us the local blockage. The important point here, really, is we move them closer together, and this is, uh, this is a proxy for the re uh, resistance, the force of the turbine. Um, and, we can, and these are the, the power coefficients. We can find a maxima, and it doesn't really matter what the number is, but there is a maxima, and it's where the turbines are close together, and they can resist the flow sensibly at a particularly high thrust level, and we can get to a maximum power point. So that was our first experimental proof that some of the theorizing might be right. You then go and say, well, that's, that's, that's great, that's a disk, we can't generate power with that, we need to develop a turbine, so we now have to start design, uh, developing turbine design models. And the problem with the wind industry design models is they don't know anything about the ground, they don't know anything about uh, the upper atmosphere, they don't know anything about the turbines on the side. So we, just, uh, we develop bespoke design methods that integrate analytic methods uh, using the wind industry with uh, computational fluid dynamics met methods. They say something about the seabed and the sea surface and the other turbines, etc. And you can use them to develop turbines that look like this. This is what we call uh, it's a high blockage turbine or a constructive interference turbine, and it really just has more cord. And uh, compared to an unblocked turbine, you see it's much smaller cord here, both the tip and the root, uh, and it's retwisted as well. And it has to be a highly evolved in the design uh, to get a turbine like this that can actually present more resistance to the flow and therefore generate more power. In terms of, I'm not going to go through all of this, don't worry. This is sort of, um, there are two sets of curves here. There's some red curves and some blue curves. And this is this performance metric. Um, what you get is if you have a turbine operating like this in an unblocked flow, you get curves down here. If you have a turbine operating in a blocked flow or with constructive interference, it comes up here somewhere. The same turbine positioned here and here will move from this power point possibly to this power point if you design it like a wind turbine. If you design it properly for interference, you move to this point, which is your peak performance point. And that's what our design methods uh, do. So um, now we move on to actually designing I'd say, real turbines. They're 1.2 meter diameter turbines. I have a few props uh, that I will pass around. I'll send one back in that direction. These are uh, one of the students, uh, Bowen Cow, who did some of the hydrodynamics work, uh, came into my office one day and instead of pre presenting graphs, just gave me uh, 3D printed blades to look at instead because they're slightly more visually uh, uh, pleasing. And I'd say this, um, this is actually one of the blades that we uh, designed. I'm not going to pass this around. This is aluminium CNC'd and then hard anodized. It's rather sharp on the back edge and I don't really want it dropped because we're going to do more experiments uh, later this year. Uh, but those who want to can come and have a look at it at the end. I'll leave it on the, uh, on, on the front bench. But please just pass the other ones around. They're slightly different. They're different evolutions of the same, of the same blade. Um, so where are we? We've got, a, we're, we're gonna, we're, we've got two of these things, 1.2 metre diameter turbines. We're going to put them in this tank here in the background. This is a big tank up in Edinburgh. It's a, unusually, it's a circular tank. Um, the flow can go in any direction. And it's got uh, wave paddles all around the perimeter here, so you can do currents and waves simultaneously. We didn't do any waves. Uh, that's, that's something for the future. And there's a little platform here, which is quite unique. Uh, you can put the turbines, you mount the turbines onto the platform, then lower it down in the water, and then run the flow, and then you can actually uh, get some... Uh, it's, it's a very efficient facility in that respect. So uh, what we did, we designed blades using our methods. We've got these, this is a cross-section through this turbine. The strain gauge block here, so we can get uh, 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 edgewise and flatwise forces out. There's a waterproof chamber here where all the electronics go. You'll see them in a second. And this shroud on the outside is all nicely 3D printed uh, uh, for a few pounds. Um, we actually borrowed this drivetrain, this black piece here, was actually borrowed from the University of Edinburgh. We're currently developing our own drivetrains uh, for our next uh, set of experiments. And we had an interface here. Inside the drivetrain, there's generators and uh, force and, uh, force and uh, thr thr thrust and torque transducers, rather. So the tank itself is uh, rather unusual. As I said, it's about 25 metres in diameter, 50 metre floor in the middle. There are fans pumping in the flow along here and then sucking it out on this side. And you get a very, very strange flow vector through the middle. Um, and this is a mapping. This is not ours. 
Uh, this is a mapping of the flow in the tank, and what you want to try and do is operate somewhere in the middle of the tank where the flow is approximately uniform, because so that's where we operate our two turbines. Uh, they're slightly downstream of the centre for various reasons, and we have a nominal flow speed of about 0.8 metres a second. The tank can go up to about 2 metres per second, but it gets very, very turbulent. In fact, actually, the conditions in the tank are such that it's not that unrepresentative of field condition uh, in terms of the level of turbulence. It's really, it's really quite uh, spectacular to watch the eddies. Um, so this is some of Bowen's work. Uh, this is designing two rotors, as I said. Uh, lots of uh, hybrid simulations and then some blade resolve simulations to do all the complex stuff around blade roots and blade tips, etc. For those who are into CFD, uh, this is blade resolve CFD with a Y plus less than one. Uh, and it's a four equation turbulence model, which is quite unusual. And that's so we can get the transition right. This was a, a transitional Reynolds number, so we had to get the transition points and the separation points and the blades absolutely right in order to get the performance and the design correct. Each simulation running into about 14,000 CPU hours per simulation, and at a guess, something in the region of tens of simulations. So something like about a million CPU hours to design the turbine. Okay, uh, but I think it was worth it. Um, so, um, these, uh, this is a snapshot underwater. This is, we actually had a GoPro that was mounted on the floor of the tank, which is, uh, you're going to see some video in a second. Uh, we tested one turbine, then we put the second one in and tested the two turbines together. They were just, the separation between them was a quarter of a diameter. Uh, it's two metres water depth, 1.2 metre diameter, uh, so it's roughly 60% depth blockage. But by doing that separation, we get roughly towards the optimum, which we found in our theory work earlier, around about 37%, like almost 40%. The global blockage, remember, is the ratio of the, the area of the turbines across the cross-sectional area of the tank. This tank, if I just flip back, is you don't really know what the width is. You don't really know what the flow is doing over here, so it's not really got any hard boundaries. So the global blockage is really quite hard to estimate. But we deliberately use this tank because it's going to be a, it's, it's a, it's a low number. We don't want our solutions are, are, are um, uh, corrupted by global blockage. We want to be away from that. So this was an anim this is a, a, a video as of a couple of minutes uh, of us constructing our turbines and then testing them. As you can see, this is me in the orangey jumper. I am allowed to hold the turbine blades while other people do complicated things. You see, I just stand there for quite a while. Um, so, we've got three blades going on. You can see all this wiring coming out of the front. This is a straight, we've got some labels. Aluminium blades, strain gauge, uh, strain gauge blocks in here. Uh, the cable's coming out. Whole uh, loom wiring, that's the Edinburgh and the cell that we borrowed. <coughs> three blades mounted on. Um, I think we've got some more labels. Uh, thrust and torque transducers in here and independent load cells in the two directions at the roots of each of the blades. I should say in these tests, nothing failed. Uh, everything <coughs> remained waterproof. Um, me looking puzzled at what's on the inside of this. Uh, there's a huge block of, uh, uh, of wiring that was done in the workshops here uh, and then for us to assemble when we got up there. Each turbine took about half a day uh, to assemble and you can see there's a 3D printed nose cone that's come off and that's our waterproof chamber in here and uh, Federico fiddling and then the, uh, then the casing's going to go back on again and finally a turbine is assembled and just so you can make sure you can see it, the turbine's now flying, it started over here it's coming over on the crane, and it's now going to be lowered somewhere into here. So this is the raised floor we have during testing. Uh, we're all st stood over here. Uh, we'll, this is the Edinburgh staff actually bolting it to the floor to make sure we don't damage their tank. Um, and sorting out the wiring, the wiring all comes back to a control, uh, 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 a control panel over here. I think we're about to have a little dry test to make sure it works in the air. And now you'll see the whole thing lowered into the floor. That takes about four or five minutes. It's not that fast. So this is when we had two turbines now, and this is the little GoPro on the front here um, coming down. I think this looks very CGI-like. Uh, it's very. I, I, it did. It was, they, they did actually. Oh, they are real turbines. So the, we tested lots of different speeds. We're not going to look at all of them. This is spinning at the same speed. It's roughly the design RPM. Uh, you can see the wake on the free surface downstream of the two turbines and actually you get a, diff a difference in the weight depending on the RPM of the turbines and actually it's quite, uh, I've been watching these at home, you get different tones from the different, <coughs> the different speeds of rotation. So here we're testing this one at a particularly high thrust in order to look at the effect on this turbine over here. So it's doing some differential testing between the two turbines. <coughs> okay, so I'm glad that video worked. Right, thank you Federica. Right, so um, just another couple of things to report on. So it's all nice, 
The turbines worked, nothing leaks. We came away with a full set of data. It was a very successful testing program. But what was, more, what was even better was actually when we started analysing the results uh, more carefully. These are five-minute averages of results. This is power and thrust of our turbines. This has all been sensibly normalised, so we don't have to look at actual numbers, but the blue dots here are for a single turbine in the water. And sorry, this is what we call the tip speed ratio, just the speed of rotation of the turbine. That's our, our single turbine across here, and this is as we increase the speed of it, we get more and more thrust building up on the turbine. When we put the second turbine in the water next to it, and operate them um, as they're designed for, we get this jump up in thrust of about 10%, and a jump up in power of about 20%. So just by, it's not just by positioning them next to each other in the water, but by designing them for that configuration, we get a substantial increase in the performance of the turbine. Um, I haven't put all the raw numbers on here, but actually for unblocked turbine, um, the results we got are the highest performing turbines that have been reported, at least, uh, I say tested, but reported uh, in the literature or have been deployed commercially. There's lots of other data that I haven't got time to go through. We had flow field data, you can see jetting flow going through the middle. Uh, we've got, uh, this is coming off the, off the strain gauges on the blades, you've got a single turbine uh, in the middle there, the blue one, and then you get uh, um, uh, a greater load, so that's the azimuthal variation in both the thrust direction and that's the torque direction, and there's variations according to the shear and the profile, etc. The other thing that was really very successful was actually the simulation work that preceded um, the experiments in terms of the design of the turbine. And Bowen did lots of work, this is a turbine here, there's a symmetry plane, so there's really two turbines, playing around with the width in his simulations, the width of the tank, trying to actually work out what the width really was. And when you do that, and you, can play in the th you compare the thrust of the turbine uh, uh, plotted against flow, uh, rotational speed here, the dots or the points there are experimental results, and you can see that actually we established it's somewhere near uh, 6 to 8 metre half width. So, um, whatever that works out, 12 to 16 metre full width of the tank, which is roughly what we designed for. And you can see that the performance points line up rather well there as well. And actually the simulations came into within about 3% of our numerical simulation. So the million CPU hours uh, that the department paid for uh, uh, was worth it, I think. Um, but also importantly for us, actually, there's this lower blue line here. Actually, as we increase the width of the tank further, we relax the global blockage further, we get no reduction or no substantial reduction in performance. But what's really important in all of this is not just the performance and the efficiency you get from a device, but what it actually means in terms of the, of the cost of energy. And this is actually quite a hard thing to get to, because you can test turbines, you can get superior performance, but until you actually go and build them, you don't know about the cost of foundations, the cost of the structure, and everything else. So you can do some hypothesizing around how you would utilize power differently. So this is a typical power against flow speed curve, either for a wind or a tidal turbine. You come up to some rating point, and after the rating point, you feather the turbine blades back in order to protect the drivetrain and the generator. And what we can do with an increased performance turbine is come up a steeper curve. And the one that I'm going to concentrate on here is the purple one. The purple one's actually where we don't change the maximum load on the turbine, so we don't really change the cost of the turbine. Uh, we just get more power at all flow speeds. You then think about where the turbine gets installed, and then that, which is, these are just distributions of flow speeds at different sites, and that tells you how much more power you get. So the original turbine would be the blue one, and I would say the purple one is the most representative uh, increase we can get, which then leads you to a cost of energy reduction in the sort of 8 to 10 percent type range. So to conclude, I was just going to give you an outlook uh, for Tidal Stream and some of the work that we're doing here. Um, one, two megawatt turbines have, have been installed. There are small arrays going in uh, across the next few years. Substantial challenges still to overcome. Uh, LCOE, the levelized cost of energy, is still uh, too high. Uh, there's a lot of OPEX uh, uh, to be, um, a lot of OPEX cost to be reduced, with lots of people looking at this kind of thing, floating time platforms, to try and help reduce some of that. Uh, survivability, fatigue damage still remain an obstacle. But also opportunities in the kind of work that we're doing, uh, looking at these sort of multi rotor type systems, reduce, increasing the performance and reducing the cost. Also, uh, potential for knowledge transfer, this is a wind turbine, this is the one of the multi-rotor Vestas wind turbines uh, they're looking at with DTU. And if you think our turbines were close together here, these are l about a metre apart on a 30 metre diameter rotor, so lots of interference going on between those rotors as well. Um, for us, and well, so the other thing for us is actually that we've proven our design methods, which is really quite uh, 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 an important step forward for us to be able to design larger 
and uh, uh, longer arrays of turbines. So we actually just got back last night from this tank in Sweden, uh, where we're going to be testing uh, in September now, and we're going to be testing our turbines again. This is a 250 meter long tank, 10 meters wide, five meters deep. And we're going to be uh, towing our two turbines using the side as a symmetry plane to generate an array of, uh, an effective array of four turbines to try and get up to increased performance uh, yet still. So, um, just a few acknowledgements. Uh, others in the group who have been, who came up and watched and helped out and held spanners and dropped things in the water and all sorts of things. And to funding agencies, EPSRC, and this is the Supergen, Supergen UK CMER that helped fund this. Uh, it's uh, uh, based in Edinburgh, it was, uh, it's EPSRC money. And also uh, CMEC Atlantis Energy, who we had some useful conversations with. Okay, thank you very much.